Chapter One of Outwitting the Hun My Escape from a German Prison Camp by Pat O'Brien. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One The Folly of Despair. Less than nine months ago, eighteen officers of the Royal Flying Corps, which had been training in Canada, left for England on the Megantic. If any of them was over twenty five years of age, he had successfully concealed the fact, because they don't accept older men for the RFC. Nine of the eighteen were British subjects. The other nine were Americans, who, tired of waiting for their own country to take her place with the Allies, had joined the British colors in Canada. I was one of the latter. We were going to England to earn our wings, a qualification which must be won before a member of the RFC is allowed to hunt the Huns on the Western Front. That was in May, 1917. By August 1st, most of us were full-fledged pilots, actively engaged at various parts of the line in daily conflict with the enemy. By December 15th, every man jack of us who had met the enemy in France, with one exception, had appeared on the casualty list. The exception was H. K. Boyson, an American, who at last report was fighting on the Italian front, still unscathed. Whether his good fortune has stood by him up to this time I don't know, but if it has I would be very much surprised. Of the others, five were killed in action three Americans, one Canadian, and one Englishman. Three more were in all probability killed in action, although officially they are listed merely as missing. One of these was an American, one a Canadian, and the third a Scotchman. Three more, two of them Americans, were seriously wounded. Another, a Canadian, is a prisoner in Germany. I know nothing of the others. What happened to me is narrated in these pages. I wish, instead, I could tell the story of each of my brave comrades, for not one of them was downed, I am sure, without upholding the best traditions of the RFC. Unfortunately, however, of the eighteen who sailed on the Megantic last May, I happened to be the first to fall into the hands of the Huns, and what befell my comrades after that, with one exception, I know only second-hand. The exception was the case of poor, brave Paul Rainey, my closest chum, whose last battle I witnessed from my German prison, but that is a story I shall tell in its proper place. In one way, however, I think the story of my own big adventure, and my miraculous escape, may perhaps serve a purpose as useful as that of the heroic fate of my less fortunate comrades. Their story, it is true, might inspire others to deeds of heroism, but mine, I hope, will convey the equally valuable lesson of the folly of despair. Many were the times in the course of my struggles when it seemed absolutely useless to continue. In a hostile country, where discovery meant death, wounded, sick, famished, friendless, Hundreds of miles from the nearest neutral territory, the frontier of which was so closely guarded that even if I got there it seemed too much to hope that I could ever get through, what was the use of enduring further agony? And yet here I am, in the land of liberty, although in a somewhat obscure corner, the little town of Moments, Illinois, where I was born, not very much the worse for wear after all I've been through, and, as I write these words, not eight months have passed since my seventeen comrades and I sailed from Canada on the Megantic. Can it be possible that I was spared to convey a message of hope to others who are destined for similar trials? I am afraid there will be many of them. Years ago I heard of the epitaph which is said to have been found on a child's grave. If I was so soon to be done for, O oh Lord, what was I ever begun for? The way it has come to me since I returned from Europe is, if, O oh Lord, I was not to be done for, what were my sufferings e'er begun for? Perhaps the answer lies in the suggestion I have made. At any rate, if this record of my adventures should prove instrumental in sustaining others who need encouragement, I shall not feel that my sufferings were in vain. 
It is hardly likely that any one will quite duplicate my experiences, but I haven't the slightest doubt that many will have to go through trials equally nerve racking and suffer disappointments just as disheartening. It would be very far from the mark to imagine that the optimism which I am preaching now, so glibly, sustained me through all my troubles. On the contrary, I am free to confess that I frequently gave way to despair and often, for hours at a time, felt so dejected and discouraged that I really didn't care what happened to me. Indeed, I rather hoped that something would happen to put an end to my misery. But despite all my despondency and hopelessness, the worst never happened, and I can't help thinking that my salvation must have been designed to show the way to others. End of chapter 1